Ever wonder how a company can be held responsible? I mean, like, really responsible for what their employees do. Especially these days, yeah. With lawsuits and corporate accountability and all that. Exactly. It's like a minefield out there for businesses. Well, that's what we're going to deep dive into today. The whole idea of respondent superior. Ah, yes. Respondent superior. It's Latin. It's the let the master answer. Ooh, that sounds serious. It is. It's the legal doctrine that can make employers liable for their employees' actions, you know, on the job. So we've got some fascinating sources to help us unpack all of this. Oh, yeah. Excerpts from a legal text. Always a good starting point. And, and get this. A multimedia article complete with a song. A song. I know, right? We'll be looking at this concept from all angles, from those supervising employees on the factory floor to the COO managing the C-suite. It's amazing how this one principle, you know, respondent superior, touches so many levels of an organization. We should probably start by clarifying that respondent superior often involves what's called vicarious liability. Okay, vicarious liability. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, essentially, it means that an employer can be held responsible for an employee's actions, even if they didn't do anything wrong themselves. So even if a company has all the right rules in place, they could still be held accountable for an employee's mistake. I mean, where's the line? Right. Well, that's where things get interesting. It all boils down to whether the employee was acting within the scope of employment when whatever happened, happened. Our source used a really good example to illustrate this. Um, the classic pizza delivery driver. Ah, yes. If the driver hits a pedestrian while they're delivering a pizza, the employer is likely liable. Makes sense. But if that driver is off doing their own thing, you know, like a personal errand, then the employer probably isn't. But how do you actually prove that an employee was or wasn't acting within the scope of their job. That feels like a gray area to me. It can be, definitely. Courts consider factors like the employee's job description, company policies, and the specific circumstances surrounding the incident. And this is where the role of those frontline supervisors you mentioned earlier becomes so important. They're often the first line of defense against these types of situations, right? Exactly. Supervisors have a huge responsibility to ensure their teams are properly trained, that they understand the company's policies, and that they're working within the scope of their job. So it's like they're managing risk every single day. In a way, yes. So let's say an employee does make a mistake and the employer is found liable under respondent superior. What happens then? What are the legal consequences? Who's ultimately held responsible? Well, that brings us to another important concept, joint and several liability. Joint and several liability. Basically, if an employee does something wrong and the employer is found liable under respondent superior, the plaintiff, the person who's suing, can actually sue both the employer and the employee for damages. Whoa. So a single action can create this ripple effect of responsibility. Exactly. That's a lot of pressure on both the company and the individual involved. It is. It really highlights why understanding this doctrine, respondent superior, is crucial for everyone in an organization, not just the folks in management. It's like this legal concept is forcing everyone to think about the potential consequences of their actions. And how those actions might impact others. Right, right. It's like this web of interconnected responsibility. It's a reminder that individual actions can have far-reaching implications, especially within a company setting. So let's shift gears a little and climb up the corporate ladder. What about the COO, the person in charge of the day-to-day -day operations? How does respondent superior play into their role? That's a great question. I mean, I'm guessing it goes beyond just avoiding lawsuits. Oh, absolutely. The COO plays a huge role in shaping the company's culture. Right. And that includes fostering a culture of compliance. Making sure everyone's following the rules. Right. It's about ensuring that the entire C-suite understands the rules of the game and the potential consequences if those rules are broken. This reminds me of the getting to compliance concept from that multimedia article we have. I found it really fascinating how they draw inspiration from the negotiation strategies in that famous book, Getting to Yes. Oh, yeah, that's a great point. What's really interesting about that approach is that it shifts away from a top-down, rule-based mentality. Right. And instead, it encourages a more collaborative approach to compliance. Where everyone's working together. Exactly. Open dialogue and shared responsibility are key. And it's not just about avoiding legal trouble, right? No, not at all. Creating that kind of culture can actually boost morale 
and create a more ethical working environment for everyone. It's about building a foundation of trust and shared responsibility, where compliance isn't just a set of rules to follow, but a mindset that's embraced by everyone. We've talked about supervisors and even the COO, but what about the CEO? Oh yeah, they're at the top right, calling all the shots. Right, so how can a CEO be held accountable under respondent superior? It's a great question because it does seem like CEOs are often so far removed from you know, the everyday actions of their employees. That's true, but you have to remember that accountability flows through every level of a company. Okay. CEOs have supervisors, too. Ah, right, the board of directors. Exactly. Board members are responsible for overseeing what the CEO does and making sure that, you know, their actions are in the best interests of the company. And all the stakeholders. Right. So, hypothetically speaking, if a CEO makes a decision that leads to an employee doing something harmful, but it's still technically within the scope of their job, could the board be held accountable? Potentially, yes. It all comes back to that chain of responsibility we were talking about earlier. You see, if a CEO creates a culture of compliance and ethical conduct, it kind of trickles down throughout the whole organization. Yeah, like setting a good example. Exactly. But if they're ignoring the rules or cutting corners, well... That sets a bad example. It does. It sets a dangerous precedent. You know, speaking of cutting corners, I've heard of companies trying to avoid liability by claiming that, you know, an employee was acting outside the scope of their employment. Oh, yeah. Essentially shifting the blame to the individual. Mm. Does that actually work? It happens, but courts are usually pretty good at recognizing when a company is trying to dodge responsibility. Right. They'll look at all those factors we discussed earlier, the job description, the company's policies, the specific circumstances surrounding the incident, all of that. So even if a company tries to say, hey, this employee went rogue, if the court finds that what they did was somehow connected to their job, the company could still be held liable. That's right. It's not a foolproof strategy. And honestly, it sends a terrible message to employees. Yeah, like they're expendable. Like the company's willing to throw them under the bus to protect itself. Which I guess goes against that whole getting to compliance thing we talked about earlier. It does. You know, that emphasis on shared responsibility and working together. Right. Smart companies know that investing in things like clear communication, thorough training, and a supportive environment, well, that's the best way to reduce risk in the long run. It sounds like preventing these situations from happening in the first place is really the key takeaway here. Absolutely. Being proactive is so much more effective than being reactive. You know, having clear policies in place, providing regular training, and encouraging open communication can really help reduce the likelihood of these issues cropping up in the first place. And that probably makes employees feel a lot better, too. It does. Knowing that their company has their back. Yeah. And isn't just seeing them as potential liabilities. Exactly. It creates a sense of trust and shared responsibility, which benefits everyone in the end. Now, we've talked a lot about these concepts, but sometimes these legal things can feel a little abstract, you know? A little bit. Do you have any like real world examples that could help make responded superior a bit more tangible? I do love a good story. Me too. Definitely helps to make these ideas feel more grounded in reality. Well, there's actually a fascinating case about a delivery driver that really highlights those nuances of scope of employment and the challenges that companies face when they're trying to figure out who's liable. All right, let's hear it. This delivery driver case. What happened? Okay, so we've got this driver. He works for a big online retailer, you know, one of those companies that delivers everything. Yeah. So he's out making his deliveries, dropping off packages, the usual. Uh. But then he decides to take a little detour. Oh. Uh, he wants a coffee, so he swings by a drive through The classic coffee break detour. Mm. Seems harmless enough, right? Right. Well, as he's waiting in line for his coffee, Bam, his truck gets rear-ended. Oh, no. And it causes this chain reaction, ends up injuring another driver. So a quick coffee run turns into a legal nightmare. Exactly. Wow. So the injured driver sues the delivery company. Of course. Argues that they're liable under responded superior, you know, for what their driver did. Well, he was driving their truck on the clock. It seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? You'd think so, but the delivery company, they fought back. Really? Yeah, they argued that the driver was actually outside the scope of his employment when the accident happened. Because he was getting coffee. Right. They claimed it was a personal errand, not an official part of his job. Ah, uh, so that's where the lines start to get blurry. 
How did the court decide what was within the scope of employment in this case? Well, they had to figure out if this detour was, you know, a minor thing or if it was a major departure from his work responsibilities. They looked at the company's policies on breaks, whether he was getting paid for that time and if getting coffee like significantly delayed his deliveries. So many things to consider. It's a lot. It's a real balancing act. So what happened? Who won? The court actually sided with the injured driver. Wow. Yeah, they found the delivery company liable. They said the coffee stop was a minor deviation, not a big departure from his work. Interesting. They even said that taking short breaks could actually make the driver perform better, you know, because he's less fatigued. That's a good point. So even grabbing a coffee can be part of the job, depending on the circumstances. This case really shows that there's no easy answer when it comes to scope of employment, huh? Nope. No magic formula. You got to look at the whole picture, all the details. Sounds like companies need to be extra careful about their policies then. Make sure everything's crystal clear. Definitely. Having really clear guidelines about breaks, personal errands, using company vehicles, all of that can help prevent confusion and protect everyone involved. I bet that delivery company changed their policies about breaks after this whole thing. I wouldn't be surprised. Cases like this often make companies rethink their procedures and make sure they're doing things the right way. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, from those frontline supervisors all the way up to the C-suite. So what's the big takeaway for our listeners? What should they be thinking about after this deep dive into Respondent Superior? You know, I think the main thing is that this concept isn't just a legal thing. It's something that everyone in a company needs to understand. At every level. Yeah, from the yeah. people managing small teams to the folks making those big decisions at the top. Because ultimately, it's all about responsibility right? How our actions can impact others. Exactly. Understanding Respondent Superior can help companies create a safer, more ethical, and honestly, more successful environment for everyone. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> this has been a really fascinating conversation. Thanks for breaking it all down for us. My pleasure. And remember, there's always more to learn about these things. Before we go, any final thoughts for our listeners? Something to leave them with. Think about the organizations you interact with every day, the places you work, the companies you buy from. How might their understanding of respondent superior or maybe their lack of understanding affect what they do and how they treat their employees? It's definitely something to ponder. Food for thought, as they say. Thanks again for joining us on this deep dive. Until next time.